everybody for coming. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is James Lindholm. I'm the chair of Marine Science Down at CSUMB. I've had the good fortune to work with Kong for a number of years, and I'm excited to provide the introduction. And I will get to the explanation of the Kong elements as part of this presentation. Um, all right, so I'm going to start off with the images that we don't have, unfortunately. Um, so I, I, I sought pictures far and wide, and nobody has any, uh, nobody that would be willing to share any compromising photos with Kong because he's the most squared away individual in our group. He, he is even keeled, and thus I had to make up some and grab some vintage Seinfeld to uh, project. We don't have those, so I thought, well, what am I going to do? We have a lot of pictures of King Kong, but that's only, you only get so much out of that. So. What I thought I'd do is set the stage a little bit so you understand who you're dealing with for the next 50 minutes as we give this presentation. So the presentation he's about to give is really about equal parts diving related and image, image processing slash uh, photography. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of context. So way back in pre-COVID days, Kong was an uh, undergraduate honors thesis at CSUMB. And he did what at the time was a very ambitious project looking at um, kelp rockfish and their habitat associations over more than a year and a half diving in, in monasteries. And this is where we get to kind of the Kong aspect. So there were, Kong was working with three of his colleagues, one of whom is here in the, in the room, Tommy. And um, so we had a challenge. And there one, one person had a project at South Monastery the other at North Monastery, and we wanted to do both projects on the same day. So the question is, do we get in the cars with the wetsuits? That doesn't sound very good. Do we walk down? That doesn't sound very good. Do we take our wetsuits off, get them sandy, get in the car, drive down, then put sandy stuff on? That doesn't sound so good. So we came up with a plan, and I'm not sure whose ultimate idea it was, but well, why don't we just stay in the water? So what we ended up doing is entering at South Monastery, swimming out, doing transects at South Monastery, surfacing, swimming all the way to North Monastery, doing submerging, doing more transects, popping up and swimming all the way back to South Monastery, which could take two and a half hours sometimes in 49 degree water. So it was, um, it, was a, it, was, it was challenging and it became known as the plan A option. And at the time our diving safety officer <laughs> was Frank Degnan who's here in the room and we would send a, um, a report to him daily for um, who was getting in the water. And Siri kept auto-correcting Cameron to Kong. And um, so that stuck. Um, there were a number of, of nicknames that went out that summer, but the only one that appears to have stuck is Kong. I'm not sure if Kong's fond of it anymore, but it is um, the one that stuck. So in a diving context, in that summer, just to give you a little bit of sense of the diving experience at an undergraduate level, in the summer of 2018, there were 111 days of summer from the end of the semester in May to the beginning of the following September, and we dove 88 of those days. Many of those times into the deep canyon at day and night for Tommy's thesis. So the Kong brings to the, the, the table an extraordinary amount of dive time, particularly for somebody who's really uh, early on in their career. So he brings that to the table. So when he speaks with authority, I think he should accept it a priori, just to I'm doing what I can, Kong, to set things up. Um, the other end of the spectrum, so this is an imagery intense project as you're gonna see too, and I think I wanna just put in a, a, a plug for Kong's photographic content. This is, if you go to cam camera.com, you're gonna get a chance to see a number of amazing images that he produces, ranging from the cosmos to the surface to undersea, and his, his collection of imagery is incredible, and his processing of imagery on so many of the projects in the lab has been critical, including the VR that you're gonna hear him talk about. So the last thing I'm gonna do, because I still don't have any compromising pictures, is um, talk about what's going moving forward. So he's been, he's been juggling a number of balls for the past year and a half or so, working in the lab, doing things, working on his thesis, He's now a Naui instructor, so he's been um, teaching, instructing divers at the breakwater and elsewhere. And he's been doing consulting, environmental consulting, working with Cindy. Last name, where's Cindy? There she is. Um, and apparently now, I just learned hot off the presses that 
he will be ascending in the Jiganon to other types of things. And so he is going to, within the mid, by mid-December, he will be the biologist program manager for Surf to Snow Environmental Resource Management, doing a variety of different projects. Yeah, good, good job. <laughs> Thank you. So that's it for Kong. You know, he's probably going to stop calling himself Kong henceforward. This is my last opportunity. So again, thank you for joining us today to hear his presentation. I'm going to now turn it over to him. Take it away. Good luck. Thank you. All right, awesome. Um, thank you, people who came here from one room away or several states away to see, yeah, to see my presentation in person. Um, the title is Habitat Mediated Efficacy of 360 Degree Diver Operated Video for Quantitative Surveys of California Reef Fish. We're just going to go right into it, starting with the introduction. Um, where we're at right now, the west coast of the United States, or what we call the Eastern Pacific Ocean, is an active continental margin. Um, what I want you to know about that is that it is it is a rough, rocky, rugose coastline, and oftentimes that scene like what we see there in Big Sur will continue down into the water um, and creates really complex rocky reefs. Additionally, there are cold water currents which begin from uh, Alaska and Canada, and they send cold water all the way down the coastline towards Mexico. So this combination of lots of rocky terrain, lots of cold water, lots of complex features, is the ideal place for giant kelp forests to form. Um, giant kelp is a macroalgae, grows very, very fast, and can grow in very dense forests in some areas, just depending on the biogeochemical conditions. Uh, but these kelp forests are very productive and diverse ecosystems. I was interested in what the fish themselves do in kelp forests and where they could be found within a kelp forest or a rocky reef. I focused on a couple of what I'd call microhabitats, so like they're very, very fine scale associations with certain features. So when you're swimming along a kelp forest or a rocky reef, you'll find some fish that are sitting on the bottom. They're in contact with the seafloor. We call those benthic fish. And then there's a lot of species that will oftentimes be found swimming just above the seafloor, kind of down on the rocky reef. Um, we call those a, uh, a demersal fish. And then there are others that occupy, occupy spaces well above the seafloor, up near the surface or the canopy, usually in association with uh, giant kelp or some other macroalgae. We call those canopy dwelling fish. Kelp forests also are economically important, not only to California, but many places where they exist. Um, this is a figure from a, a previous Ocean Protection Council report. And if you just look at the uh, y-axis, you can tell that kelp forests bring in um, revenue for different industries around the state of California, particularly tourism and recreation, because many people want to go experience those for themselves firsthand. But kelp forests are not fixed in time or space. They're always changing. So here's a semi-local example, Point Arena, just up north, where in 2008, uh, if we look at the uh, yellow-orange from that satellite image, lots of kelp uh, canopy cover visible from the air. But in 2019, it was pretty much gone. So these are dynamic systems. They fluctuate um, just depending on the kind of seasonal biogeochemical processes that are occurring. So thus, thus there's a need to study these systems. Um, and the primary way that kelp forests, at least here, have been studied is by underwater visual census, or UVC. It's just an acronym that means divers are going underwater and they're writing their observations down on waterproof paper and slates. Uh, usually this is done in the form of a transect, so swimming forward in a direction, but you can modify it depending on your research question. Um, and there are a lot of benefits of performing UVC transects. It's non-extractive, so the organisms, the fish, they're not being disturbed or they're being very minimally disturbed. We're not taking them out of the system or harming them. 
there's few equipment costs beyond just the basic scuba gear. So you don't need anything really hardcore in terms of budgets. And it's fairly adaptable depending on where you're, where you're doing your diving, what system you're in. It's not a perfect solution though. There are some disadvantages. Um, what I think is a strong one is that there's no ability to revisit the actual observations that the data came from. So what I mean by that is a diver will be swimming along on their transect, they'll write an observation, and now that's just probably a species name and a number. But the context behind what was going on for that individual fish is lost. We don't really know what was uh, happening to the fish at the time of observation. Additionally, when there are really, really high volume or um, high densities of fish in front of a diver, it can be hard to count and size all of those fish accurately. So, at certain concentrations of organisms, it becomes a little, a little difficult. So, a way to remedy that is by using uh, like an imagery-based solution. You might see imagery studies in the form of divers themselves swimming cameras underwater or a different tool like an ROV or a submersible, an AUV perhaps, that is taking a camera underwater. And in the deep sea, this is sort of the norm because humans just cannot go that deep without some, some very serious um, foresight because it is kind of dangerous. Um, so imagery studies are another option for studying kelp forests. And one of the advantages, in my opinion, is that it preserves that actual fish to environment um, relationship that happens at the time of observation. So in this image, there is a copper rockfish and it is associating with all of those rocks, invertebrates, and features right there on the screen. So if that was a UVC observation, we wouldn't exactly have that context. Additionally, uh, Imagery-based studies will allow researchers to revisit the video, either themselves or passing it along to a colleague to ask questions that were unanticipated at the time of capture. So if I perhaps took this photo and was interested in the fish, someone else may want to look at this photo and then ask what is happening to the invertebrates or the just physical structure there. So the behavior of organisms and the habitat associations are preserved much better in video. Some of the disadvantages though, um, and there are, is that the cost of all the underwater camera equipment is, is prohibitively expensive. Um, like cameras are not supposed to work underwater. So making that work well for scientists is difficult and expensive. And it also costs a lot of time and money and effort to extract data from that imagery. Not only do the scientists have to, let's say, swim a camera once, then they have to review it probably one, two, three times even, uh, in order to properly analyze that data. Some species too, like the really cryptic ones or things that are heavily backlit or silhouetted, can be difficult to get a good um, identification of an individual, like what species it is. And then historically, video two also has fairly narrow field of view. So that diver performing UVC, they may be able to see off of their survey volume make note of something interesting, even if they weren't looking for it. But with the video, the context behind everything is kind of lost. Like, what's happening just outside of the frames? We don't really know what was happening there. So, the solution to that would be 360 degree video. Uh, if you're not familiar, 360 cameras, they, they just record everything in all directions at once. So, it will overcome that narrow field of view while still recording and providing that permanent record of the, of the daily activity, of the dive, of the study. Um, what we know about the underwater world is just an artifact of like the tools or methods we use to survey it. So with the um, progression of this technology from being really expensive and difficult to very easy to use, consumer friendly, I saw that as an opportunity to uh, ask what we can learn from using 360 cameras. The literature on 360 video studies underwater is fairly new, it's about a decade old. Um, there already have been some really impactful papers and what I took away from reading it was that for like really rare or um, cryptic species, things that aren't seen a lot, 
using 360 cameras, so you're seeing more, that will help reduce false negatives um, and help you get a better sense of the true fish abundance at a site. What I noticed though in reading those papers was that for the most part, these studies were stationary video. So they were cameras that were sitting on the seafloor, weighted down, or they were suspended over a stationary boat um, and not moving. The studies usually took place in places with, uh, with clearer water, so you know, maybe a little more tropical, coral-like uh, environments. And they were targeting conspicuous taxa, so things like sharks, rays, turtles, tunas, like these big organisms that are easy to identify. It's also been calibrated to other video techniques, but never that I found to what an actual diver in the water will see. So I had the idea, if we could take what's known about a UBC transect, incorporate 360 video cameras into it, could we create some sort of new transect technique that a scuba diver could use to survey a shallow Californian reef? My objectives were to describe a workflow for conducting 360 video transects, as well as describe how to collect in, uh, data from those 360 videos. Um, I based this experiment off of an ecological study just to kind of like set some paradigms and ground rules uh, moving forward. I split the project into two questions to govern my experimental design. So I asked um, what the similarities and differences between how UVC transects and 360 video transects survey fish between sites as well as between macro habitats. So the sites are just distinct places that were geographically um, broken up, but all of the sites themselves contain multiple macro habitats or habitat types. So all the sites had kind of a mixture of things going on within them. For my first question, I predicted that the most complex site, which was North Monastery Beach, um, would have highest species richness, diversity, and density. And I also predicted that there would be greater richness, diversity, and density from the 360 degree video transects. So I predicted that just as habitat complexity increased, all of those metrics would increase, and that the 360 video with the greater field of view than what a diver surveys would, would also capture greater um, richness, diversity, and density. And then further, I predicted that there would be similar differences between methods across my sites. So if one method identified something weird going on at one of the sites, the other method would be in agreement with it. They wouldn't like diverge um, in their findings. For my macro habitat question, um, it's similar. I predicted that there would be higher richness, diversity, and density in the high kelp macro habitat. So sites that are very, very high relief and have a lot of macro algae, a lot of kelp forests in them. Um, and then similarly, I predicted greater richness, diversity, and density from the video. Again, that greater field of view, greater um, counts. And then that, again, they would um, be in agreement between macro habitat. The methods would be in agreement between macro habitats. So it's a big methods heavy study. How did I do it? I chose four shore diving sites distributed along the Monterey Peninsula. Um, the diving occurred between July 2020 and September 2022, and all my transects occurred between uh, 15 and 60 feet to seawater. The first site I'll tell you about is the Monterey Breakwater Wall. This is on the Monterey side of the peninsula. Um, very heavily touristed beach, uh, very popular to dive at. The underwater scene, if I could summarize that site in just one picture, it would look something like this. So there is a pretty high relief rocky wall that moves in a straight line out. And then up above, there is a kelp forest that exists for a pretty good stretch of that, um, of that site. It's not the entire wall, but most of it. The next site I looked at was Butterfly House. This is on the Carmel side. Um, Butterfly House is a challenging site to get to. Um, but it has some interesting history. This house, the Butterfly House, just sold for $29 million. So 
whenever I take um, my scuba students there, I tell them they're about to do a $29 million dive, try to set some fun expectations. Again, Butterfly House, if I could summarize it with just one photo, it would kind of look like this. Um, my transects did not occur in very much kelp, so it was all fairly no, you know, like no kelp at Butterfly House, but very, very high relief rock features. So that rock in front of me there is about 30 feet high as I was swimming along, so that kind of sets the scale. There's some dramatic changes in elevation. Moving south, my third site was North Monastery Beach. Uh, another very popular dive site. You can do some deep diving here. North Monastery Beach had the most dense kelp forest by far. So it was very dark underneath North Monastery Beach. There's a lot of very, very high rocky uh, relief uh, features. And then it steeply slopes into the Carmel Canyon on the right hand side. So where the screen's very bright, that's just sunlight, but it gets very, very deep and dark as you go down that slope. Only a couple hundred meters away is my last site, South Monastery Beach. Um, though close in proximity to North Monastery, it is very different underwater. At the time I was diving there, there, were no, there was no kelp. Uh, it was all just bare rock when I was completing my transects. And the topography, the relief was very, very flat, much less complex than North Monastery. Um, so a good contrast between North and South Monastery. The materials I used were uh, Insta360 1X and X2 cameras. So these are very affordable consumer grade 360 video cameras, but they produce very high quality video. Um, I used several different models of dive lights to illuminate the seafloor on my videos when I was uh, filming. I standardized all of my effort using 30 meter transect tapes. And the photo on the right is how I configured my gear. So on the top of my slate where I was writing down my UVC observations, I mounted the 360 cameras. So the view between um, the 360 video and the UVC were one-to-one, I mean, one. they were almost exactly uh, aligned. Got a video for you. So at the beginning of every uh, dive, I would use one of those 30 meter transect tapes to get an estimate of visibility. Um, so here I'm holding on to the slate with a camera mounted on it and my dive buddy is just slowly moving backwards. We're extending the tape and while doing so, I'm counting on my fingers how, how much line has been spooled out. Uh, this helps get a sense of not only what the visibility was as measured by our eyes, but as measured by the camera when we review it later. Um, we will talk about why we needed to know the visibility in a future slide. Moving on to the methods I used for UVC transects. So these were adopted from um, fairly uh, well-known methods by like ReefCheck, Pisco, other monitoring agencies that use um, UVC in California. But essentially, after the diver tied this, uh, the transect to a line of kelp, they would just extend that transect tape out in a predetermined straight line, and then write down all observations within an estimated survey swath. So that estimated swath was one meter on the left and right side of the diver, and then one meter above and below the diver. So think a two meter by two meter by 30 meter transect. Um, all the fishes on the inside of that swath were identified to the lowest taxonomic level and then counted. Um, everything on the outside of that swath was excluded. Uh, the transects occurred a meter above the substrate, so the very bottom of that transect was, uh, was counted. Meanwhile, uh, the 360 video was constantly recording the entire transect. And I already said that the cameras are pretty easy to use, so besides just pushing start and stop, there was really no extra cost or extra uh, effort associated with using them underwater. So the 360 camera was simultaneously recording everything that was going on around that UVC transect. So a, bit, a, much, a much greater volume was being sampled. Back at the lab, 
Um, that's where the real difference in effort began. The uh, 360 video took a lot of extra time to actually get data out of. So the very first thing to do was to post-process the data. Um, I used Insta360 Studio to just export the video into a, a usable format. Um, and then I brought that video into Premiere Pro. There what I did was rotate the video so that the forward direction of the video was always the forward direction of the transect because the cameras do tend to drift a little bit over time. Um, I added little title cards and just important metadata, such as like depth, time of day, divers, what the transect ID was. And then I also did a little bit of color grading on the transects so that they just appeared more natural or like how they actually should look in real life. Now I've got another bit of video for you. So this is what a typical transect would look like. Um, the 360 camera is mounted at the top of the slate and it's recording the entire process. You'll notice I'm split sort of in half. Uh, so if you've never seen 360 video looking like this, that's the backwards direction. And the forward direction is sort of in the middle of the screen, uh, the direction that I'm swimming. As I see fish pop up in that two by two by 30 meter UVC swath, I write them down on my slate. So it looks like I just saw something there. But in terms of the 360 video, nothing's actually going on until after, after the fact. have 40, 50 plus hours of that that you could watch later. So now onto my third piece of software, Event Measure. Um, Event Measure is a video data logging program and it allows users to make points in both space and in time. Um, typically this is used in stereoscopic camera uh, studies where you're measuring the length of a fish or an organism. But here I was just placing two dimensional points on fish so that I could keep track of all the ones that I was seeing. Um, this is the view that you would see in event measure. So on the bottom row, I've got all my data being generated as I am clicking on fish and identifying them. If I zoom into that view here, um, this is a transect where I just passed, actually uh, James in this case was holding the camera, just passed a big school of uh, blacksmith, so Chromis punctipinus. And Already right there, you're seeing a benefit of using video. It'd be very hard to um, accurately and reproducibly count all of those fish and size all of those fish. But in video, of course, we can just pause it and go frame by frame and make sure we don't miss anything. So, oops. Let me go back one slide. Um, next, I needed a way to make sure I was repeatedly um, identifying those different macro habitats that I was interested in, in testing the difference between. I determined that relief, so the vertical change in elevation, as well as the presence or absence of macroalgae, so I just call that kelp, would be important in determining like what sort of fish would be there. So I made this little Punnett square, and that's how I determined my four macro habitat treatments. There could either be High relief with kelp, there could be high relief without any kelp, there could be low relief with kelp, and there could be low relief without any kelp. So this continuum of very complex to less complex or simple uh, macro habitats was how I broke everything down. And in order to classify those uh, with some defendable way, uh, while I was watching video, I'd pause every 15 seconds, and then in the immediate area that, that, uh, that, that I was at during the transect, I would do an estimated two meter scan in a full circle. Um, if there was high relief, it became a high relief tr uh, point, and if, it was, if there was kelp there, it would become a kelp point. Then over the course of that transect, the most commonly occurring um, habitat treatment classification became what that transect was classified as. So here we have three instances of high relief kelp present and one instance of high relief no kelp present. So this would be a high relief kelp transect. Um, finally too, I, I also wanted to 
spin some of the species together based on where they were anticipated to be found. So I came up with this from personal experience over hundreds of dives in Monterey and Carmel where I see these species most commonly. Um, consulting guides on, uh, on the fish biology around here and some published papers that I had found. But I broke them down into a canopy gill. So again, those fish that are found up at the top of the water column, uh, up in the kelp glades. A demersal guild, those are the fish that are found near the bottom, but not quite living on the seafloor. And then a benthic guild, the fish that just live on the seafloor. I needed a way to standardize the two techniques, actually control for effort um, between the two methods. And so the most obvious way would be using volume to turn counts into densities. Um, for the UVC transects, it was pretty straightforward and repeatable. I estimated it was two meters on the sides, two meters top to bottom, and then 30 meters in a straight line. So all together, we do some geometry, and that makes it a 120 cubic meter transect for my UVC transects. 360 video, however, was a far more complicated task. Um, there was no way to actually measure a distance in 360 video, nor to, to subsample, to like constrain that distance if we could see past a certain point. So I estimated that a 360 video transect was equivalent basically to a cylinder, because it's seeing, it's like a sphere moving forward, and then when we stop, there's still an extra half of a sphere um, at the very end of the transect. And if you go back to some high school geometry, uh, the number that we need to know for that is the radius of those shapes. So I used the visibility as measured at the beginning of the dive as the radius for these three-dimensional shapes to create the volume of my transect. Um, finally, I wanted a second way to compare these uh, techniques that was not dependent on volume, and I ended up calling this count per meter. So this was volume independent, but I thought of count per meter as a measurement of abundance independent of the volume, and I just standardized them by how many meters of effort going forward uh, each technique measured. So think of UVC as individuals per meter of transect tape, and uh, 360 video as individuals per meter of video watched. So unlike the, uh, the volume, which will exclude fish outside of that volume, um, count per meter would count all of those things as that transect is progressing forward in space and time. Uh, for my statistical design, I was comparing first richness and diversity. So a review of those, richness is the number of species. So on that top lane, the left side has greater richness, it has more species. Um, so I was comparing the richness between methods between sites. Um, I used a two-way ANOVA to do, much of my, uh, to do much of my tests. That allowed me to compare not only differences between the methods, but also differences between the sites and or habitats, and then interactions between how method, site, and habitat uh, interacted with each other. Next, I looked at species diversity, which is not only the number of species, but also the relative proportion of individuals of each species. So on the bottom lane there, the right-hand side has a more diverse community because on the left side, that community is dominated by just one fish, whereas it's more even on the right-hand side. Next, I looked at the volumetric density differences between, um, between methods, both at the site level and at the macro habitat level. Volumetric density was measured as individuals divided by volume, which I already went over. So that's how I um, set that up, again, with a two-way ANOVA, looking at differences in density between methods as well as between sites and habitat. Next, I looked at count per meter, so the differences in that technique for the entire project-wide count of fish as well as those uh, fish separated or subsetted into the different, um, mac or the different fish guilds that I came up with earlier on. And then finally, I sort of looked at how all this would appear as ordinated um, in a, 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 a 
method called NMDS, which is non-metric multidimensional scaling. Uh, this is a way to condense a lot of information into two axes. And I'll get into a little bit more of what that means later on, but it's a visualization of the community composition between the different methods, sites, and transects. Let's move into the results, what I actually found from doing all this. Um, in total, I extracted data from 149 UVC and 360 degree video transects across 24 dives. Uh, the number of fish observations made from UVC was 3,462, and the number of fish observations made from 360 video was 4,820. So more fish seen from 360 video. And again, these, these are overlaid. These transects happen at the exact same place at the exact same time. Um, going forward to this color palette, that kind of teal blue and the red salmon um, will, will continue for 360 video and UVC. Um, another immediate result was that species were better identified from UVC data. And I already told you that uh, one of the downsides to using cameras is that sometimes it can be hard to identify a fish to the species level. So UVC always got fish down to a species level, whereas 360 video sometimes could not. It might get down to the family or the genus level, um, but occasionally from 360 video, I said, look, I know that's a fish. But that's, as, that's as detailed as I can confidently say. So um, something to note is that 360 video did produce a lot of uh, unknown rockfish, unknown uh, prickleback, or just plain unknown fish. Um, if there's one thing that I want you to take away from the results slides, it's, it's what happens on uh, this gray slide that's gonna repeat itself a couple of times. So as I go over results, this will start populating with the important differences between UVC and 360 video transects. And then also coming up, I have a lot of clustered bar charts. So just to um, kind of orient everyone on how to read these, um, at the top of the bar chart, there will be a title. Down on the bottom side, the x-axis, that will always be either site or macro habitat. The y-axis will be the numeric metric of interest. So on this example, it's species richness. The bars are colored by method, either 360 video or UVC. The error bars represent one standard error. And if you see any yellow highlighting or arrows, those indicate significant results. All right, so like I said, what I want you to take away is what's coming on these gray slides. UVC and 360 video more or less had equivalent species richness and diversity. Um, this is seen on this example here. So when I looked at species richness, differences between method and between sites, there was no difference at all between methods, but I did reveal that South Monastery had lower richness than the rest of the sites. When I looked at diversity between methods and between sites, I found no differences between methods or between sites. When I looked at richness between methods and between habitats, I found no difference between methods, but there was higher species richness uh, within the high kelp macro habitat. And when I looked at um, diversity between methods and between habitats, I found no difference between methods, and again, there was higher diversity in the high kelp macro habitat. So I just said that there was no difference between methods. I think what this means is that if you're already going to go out and perform UVC uh, techniques, you're already going out to monitor and do a, a lot of heavy field work, um, it's not that you don't gain anything from doing the 360, but it's going to add extra work uh, on the back end of your project. However, if you can find a way to passively survey a reef, uh, maybe by installing a 360 camera on some other piece of gear, or if you're going out for not the purpose of doing UVC transects, but you have a 360 camera with you, you can still collect uh, pretty strong data on species richness and diversity. So a uh, former project that happened, uh, I was not involved with, but um, 
a company did some really interesting 360 video transects at like the very surface layer of coral reefs. And so I believe you could, you could totally get um, really good species richness and diversity data from doing something like this, like installing a camera on like a, a, a scooter or some other piece of gear. All right, so now moving on to density. Uh, density was not equivalent between UVC and 360 video techniques. We'll get into that. And this is the volumetric density, so species counts divided by volume. If we think about how that happened, because I already said that 360 video did um, count more things, but not that much. Uh, the, the problem here is in how the volume was calculated. So UVC transects surveyed an estimated 16,000 cubic meters of seawater. And 360 video transects est surveyed an estimated 1,149,000 cubic meters of seawater. Uh, the average visibility was 9.8 meters. So 9.8 times 9.8 times 30 is going to be far different than 2 times 2 times 30. So just the greater field of view and using visibility as our radius for those three-dimensional shapes, it will increase the volume therefore decreasing the density. So now going to my clustered bar charts, if we, I mean, if we even look for the 360 video bars, we can't even really see them. Um, they're, they're so shrunk down uh, towards zero on the y-axis. So um, between methods, the 360 video surveyed far, or uh, recorded far, far fewer, um, far less density than UVC transects in the blue. And then looking at the uh, habitat difference, uh, the same story holds true. UVC just far excelled at, um, at measuring density compared to 360 video. And I already sort of told you what I think is happening here. Um, when we use the visibility as the radius for uh, our three-dimensional transect shape, um, we can't measure out to the distance of where a fish is nor can we repeatedly subsample to a known distance or a known visibility. So that means that we're, we're just sort of taking our best guess at um, how far out we can actually like, see and then uh, realistically measure using this method. I also think that fish are not uniformly distributed throughout all parts of the water column. So just because the 360 cameras can survey a lot more at once, it doesn't mean that there's going to be fish there. If we look straight ahead and kind of use those red lines as an estimate of where the 360 trans or sorry, where the UVC transect occurred within this 360 video, that's kind of where all the fish are in this like demersal low laying zone. And out to the side, out above, there are some fish, but it doesn't scale with how much extra water is being surveyed all around the camera. Next, I looked at count per meter um, between sites and between macro habitats. And for count per meter, it's tricky. Uh, these methods will be equivalent depending on the scale that you use. So at large scales, all of my data combined, I found that um, count per meter was greater when measured from 360 video than it was from UVC. And both methods revealed the same result, that uh, count per meter was greatest at the breakwater site. So one method was greater, but they both showed the same results for that breakwater site. When I looked at all of the data, all of the fish combined, um, and then split it up by the macro habitats, there was the same difference where 360 video um, had greater count per meter than UVC transects, but um, Macro habitat was not significant in determining, or there were, there were no significant differences between the macro habitats that I looked at. So this is where it gets complex, where I said that uh, the scale matters. When I subset the data by those fish guilds that I uh, predetermined, um, when I look at the canopy guilds, so all those fish that should be up above in the water column, up in the kelp, um, method did not uh, did not matter. There were no differences between method, um, but between the sites, the South Monastery site had lower count per meter than the rest of the sites. 
when I subset to the benthic guild, all the fish down below, same thing, method, they were equivalent, um, but now breakwater has greater count per meter than the rest of the sites. And when I looked at the difference between macro habitats, I just combined all these onto one slide because it's the exact same result. There were no significant differences between methods or between macro habitats for um, count per meter. So interesting result how it changes with the scale. And I think what is happening is just that when I lumped all my data together, there's a lot of data and it's going to detect trends better than at smaller scales. I think maybe repeating this over, um, over multiple geographic areas, not just the Monterey Peninsula, but throw in some sites further north, further south, that could help kind of flush out those ideas. Um, but just when looking at only one type of fish, like just the bottom dwellers, the methods are pretty much equivalent. All right, so finally, um, we're gonna move on to community composition and the UVC transects and 360 video transects Again, more or less reported similar community composition and community structure um, to each other. So moving on to these NMDS plots, um, to orient you on how to read these, the uh, X and Y axis, um, the exact numbers, don't try to read into those, but what matters here is how close or spread apart the actual um, points are. Each point represents a transect and the um, closer transects are together, it means that those transects are more similar to each other. The further away they are, it means they are more dissimilar or different from each other. And the ovals you see represent 95% confidence intervals um, for that, that type of met that method. Uh, this is all of the transects plotted together. And the what, you'll, what I hope you notice is that they are very, very similar in how they are um, ordinated here. There's a lot of overlap between method, and there are some things going on over here on the left-hand side where there's a bunch of transects that were significantly different from their counterparts. So now I'm gonna take this plot and add in site. So now the colors represent site, and the difference between circles and triangles represent method. Um, Again, there's a lot of overlap. Much of those 95% confidence intervals are stacked like right on top of each other. But these uh, green transects and these green confidence intervals are kind of skewed out here to the left. And that represents the breakwater site. So what I take away from this is that the two methods produce very similar results in that they showed breakwater was a little bit different from the rest of the site. What I've done now is I've separated the methods into two separate plots. So it's not that I just split them apart. These are like replots, uh, like reorganizations of the data. Um, UVC transects are on the left and 360 video transects are on the right. And then the colors represent sites again. And again, split apart, you can see that both show that the green transects, the breakwater site, is a little bit different than, than the rest of the other transects. So, Something's going on with the breakwater. It's a little bit different than the others. And to investigate that even further, I placed species vectors on top of these transect points. So there's now a bunch of stuff up here on the screen. But essentially, if you look at those vectors, the um, direction and length of the line indicates uh, how strongly correlated that species is with the transect color that it's pointing at. Um, and because breakwater looks a little different, I was interested in why that was. On both UVC and 360 video, the two species that stood out to me that were strongly correlated with the breakwater site were California sheephead and blacksmith. These are typically Southern Californian fish, but they seem to thrive at the breakwater site. Um, so I think my data are capturing that across both techniques, which is what I, what I predicted as my third bullet point on my, um, my hypotheses slide, was that those techniques would not diverge if there was some sort of difference between sites. Um, here now we're looking at the same thing, but instead of split apart, 
or instead of colored by habitat, sorry, instead of colored by sites, we're colored by habitats. Again, very, very similar um, between methods, and there's a lot of overlap. So I think this shouldn't be a surprise. The sites, or the, the habitats that make up the sites around Monterey Bay are not that different from each other. I didn't compare Alaska to Baja, California. Um, there is a little bit of a difference, perhaps, with the light blue, the low-relief kelp site. But generally, the habitats within Monterey Bay are very similar, and both methods are going to report that. So all of this NMDS plotting, I think, really just reinforced some of the results I got with um, my prior tests and uh, plots. So now, let's just wrap this up, figure out what all of that means. I wanted to figure out if 360 video was even viable to use in a subtitle, fast scuba diver uh, method, and I think it is, but it depends on what you're trying to capture. In terms of species richness and diversity, they were equivalent between methods, and both, uh, both found some differences between the sites or between the habitats that they were looking at. Density, as measured, typically by counts divided by volume, so like individuals per cubic meter, those were not equivalent. And I think until we can figure out a better way to handle 360 volumetric density, that's gonna be difficult to compare to historic data sets. Count per meter, um, so just taking how much horizontal distance we've surveyed and then dividing that by our counts, that more or less works, and it depends on the scale at which you are asking questions. How much data do you have, and what types of, like how, how, how big are you trying to answer a question? And the way I plotted my NMDS plots, um, or the way the NMDS plots turned out, they revealed, again, similar community composition between, uh, between sites and between habitats. So I just think it depends on what you're trying to answer with your 360 video surveys. In the future, what I think would be interesting is if we can get stereoscopic 360 underwater. These cameras already exist. They are definitely a lot more expensive than the type that I used. Um, but the benefit to using a stereo 360 camera is that you could not only actually measure the length of a fish, which is helpful because then we can get, um, we can generate numbers like how much biomass there is uh, at a site but it would allow us to solve that volumetric density issue. We could actually measure out to a fish or subset data to a known volume of water and not get those volumetric density differences. I also think that 360 video transects have merits looking at other types of taxa and in other environments. So I, I purposefully wanted to test it in a challenging visibility area such as Monterey Bay and it worked very well. In fact, visibility was not much of, a, of an impact on the results. So I think moving this into clear water, a coral system, is just gonna make it easier to work with. And because it's surveying everything at once, there's no reason that this couldn't be turned down uh, while you're watching it. And then look at things like invertebrates uh, or you know, other, other taxa that aren't mobile fish. That should actually be easier in the long run. There's also a lot of future application for either, um, either crowdsourcing your data analysis. So one person can collect a ton of imagery, reduce the travel costs associated with um, you know, long distance travel. So sorry to all the people that wanna go cool places with their advisors. Um, but you could remotely analyze the video or use it as a training exercise for like the next generation of scientists for um, students at various age ranges um, and kind of get underwater immersion into their hands and get them practicing some underwater science. That's all I have for future work. So with that, I'm gonna move into some acknowledgements and wrap this up for questions. Um, all this would not have been possible without very first my committee because they were a requirement. Um, <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, so the very first person I would like to talk about is James Lindholm, who introduced me. Um, James and I have done some wacky experiences together. 
all up and down California. We've been to the Caribbean on a cruise ship together. Um, we've had ice cream eating contests. It's been a pretty wild ride, and I just kind of said, like, sure, I can figure out your 360 thing. I hadn't in the past, but I said I could probably do it. Um, so thanks for, you know, investing that time and energy on me, um, having those opportunities available for me to help out with. Scott, I've also worked with for some time. I was uh, here as a volunteer when I was an undergrad. Um, Scott is an amazing fish person, and I have to say my favorite Scott memory is when we're trying to load all this science gear onto, um, onto a boat to go to Catalina, Scott did an amazing job at not only accommodating the science gear, but making sure that the cases of beer also got onto the boat with his expert packing skills. And the, yeah, the, the, the crew back on Catalina Island were very thankful. And Amanda, um, the, my first encounter, not in person, but knowing of Amanda, was I was volunteering at the Sanctuary Exploration Center uh, up in Santa Cruz. And for like 12 hours, I was just listening to this looped recording of Amanda talking about a sponge that she saw on a, uh, on a, a, a research cruise. So I guess I didn't get sick of you during that day. Um, and I think I cornered Amanda and said like, hey, I know we're both running late to class, but can you be on my committee? And Amanda said, of course, let's talk about it. And she got to know the project. So thank you very much for being the last person that I needed and really contributing a lot to it. Um, some of the funding that contributed to this uh, project was the Dr. Earl H. Myers and Ethel H. Myers Oceanographic Marine Biology Trust. That paid for a lot of my materials. Private donations to the Rote Professorship in Marine Science and Policy paid for some other materials. Um, California Ocean Protection Council bought a piece of software that was used in this project. And Otter Bay Wetsuits gave me a wetsuit at one point. And I was very thankful for that, um, for their, their wetsuit student scholarship. Other people that made this possible um, were Andrew Morgan from the CSUMB Research Diving Program. There was not a lot of field work going on in the summer of 2020. And the CSUMB Dive Locker went from going or housing about 100 students a week to zero students a week. So Drew helped myself and two other grad students, Travis and Justin, really begin our field work. And it was kind of the catalyst for a lot of this. Um, Drew was also an excellent mentor as I was becoming a scuba instructor myself. So he's out in uh, DEMA right now, hoping, hopefully having a great time, but thank you, Drew. Um, I had a lot of dive support from grad students and undergrads, uh, Travis and Justin, who not only were figuring out their own thesis projects, but helping me get my methods dialed in. Um, we had some undergrad support and Jordan Velasco, who isn't here, but I hope can, uh, hopefully is tuned in, but Jordan did, I think, almost all of my dives with me, um, and he did not have to do that. It was incredible to have his support, so I, I'm very thankful for him. Gammon Koval um, recently graduated from Moss and gave me some help kind of perfecting my R script and generating some results, so thankful to Gammon for that. The Moss Landing Marine Lab staff and faculty are just instrumental at getting in here, um, doing your work, and figuring out all those things that are in the student handbook, but you don't know what page they're on. I think I've emailed Tara many, many times just saying like, I don't know what this thing is, can you help me? And Tara's always great at getting back. Uh, some of the fish illustrations you saw were from Larry Allen at, um, at CSUN, so thankful for him for putting those out for the world to use. Um, there's also lots of family and friends here or online that I am deeply thankful for. Uh, if I've ever talked to any of you for a couple seconds to a couple hours, uh, either because I needed some help, I wanted to run something by you, or you just listened to me vent for a little bit, uh, you helped, so thank you very much. Um, super thankful for my partner, Connie. She defended her thesis almost to this day a year ago, and so she was some light that there is a way to get out of grad school. And I appreciate her listening to, you know, staying up with me while I'm like typing away or just giving me some advice. And our cat that we just adopted in May, he also, well, he helped too. Um, thank you all for being here today and listening, and I will take any questions as they come. Great job, so
I guess for the benefits of people that are tuning in, we're going to ask people who have questions to step up to the mic here in the middle of the in the middle aisle. So please step up there to ask your questions. Cameron, wonderful, wonderful job. Um, I had a quick question. Uh, one of the other things that comes to mind when I think about managing and processing such large, amount of, large amounts of video for future years especially is uh, you need somewhere to store it. You need somewhere to, to put it in a way that with UVC that takes up way less space. So I'm sure you've thought about this, but I was curious about any thoughts you had about what you think the best solution for this is or, or where it should be stored. Yeah. Um, thanks, Alex. I think my total video storage footprint is about two terabytes for this project. And so that exists on an external drive that exists uh, graciously at CSUMB's Google uh, Drive storage. All that may be ending. Um, <laughs> so it, it is a significant cost to store all of these. Um, when I started, a single day of dieting was 100. Um, so I think the long-term preservation of this is going to be on some sort of YouTube format as I've archived all of my stuff, um, just digitally, but you know, that's not exactly in your complete control. Other than that, you may have to pay for a, like a data hosting website or service to really archive it forever because, um, physical media is kind of risky. Cool, thank you. Thanks. Hi, great job. Um, not a fish person, so bear with me. But um, I was interested in your density conclusions. I totally agree that you know the whole volume not being exactly right could be leading to those differences. But part of me also just wonders, like, are we just generally overestimating density with UVC transects? And like, what do you think implications are for that ecologically? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so when you're taught to do a UVC transect, you have to be very, um, you have to have a lot of self-control to not just veer off because you see something cool and you want to survey that. So it's usually taking like a compass heading, having a predetermined plan to stay, to stay on track. And the idea is that if you repeatedly survey a bunch of things very precisely, you'll, you'll capture the whole community. And if you veer towards the subjects of interest, then 100% of the time it's going to reflect that. So perhaps UVC could be oversampling density. Um, I think the ecological implications of that, it could be falsely reporting like positive hope for marine protected area planning. Um, yeah, it would just be overinflating density. I, I think, however, that the more likely conclusion is that the 360 video is under underestimating density because of that volume yeah. uh, calculation. Cool. Thanks. My question is slightly outside of the scope of your project, but you talked at length about how one of the limitations of using the video surveying is the amount of time that it takes to process and go through all that. Do you see a future in which that uh, human cost could be greatly reduced by the development of AI's ability to count and size things accurately? Yeah, I do. So already um, for the for event measure of the software I've used to like work uh, on my, my video, there is a, um, a development where it, it's starting to do that for people. Um, and I think that is going to be the solution to making this like a rapid go out, get as much video as possible, and now you have like I said, really awesome species richness and diversity estimates for a whole site or over time. Um, so yeah, I, I think that is going to be the solution. Thanks. All right, Travis. <laughs> Hello, Cameron. Um, <laughs> great job. Um, so as someone who is also working, uh, working with uh, testing methodologies, uh, one thing that I'm really excited about is reducing inter-variability among surveyors. Um, going underwater, making observations, like you said, task loading. Um, it's very common for people to draw, to find different data. Do you think that that inter-variability is reduced when we can sit people behind um, a computer screen? Yeah, definitely the, uh, 
um, variability between human divers in the water that would be reduced. Um, I also talked about pass floating underwater, so just being kind of overwhelmed with all you have to do. Like you're trying to a survive underwater, but also accurately count and uh, ID everything in front of you. So just slowing down and being able to digitally do that. Um, yeah, and you can you can supervise people. You can all train each other up so that. You, you're looking at the exact same fish in space and time, and then you should be able to have basically a like the master key, the teacher's edition to each transect to train your staff on. I like that analogy. I'm going to use that. Thank you. <laughs> we have a couple questions online yeah. so in the chat. One, um, great job, Cameron. Do you think the high density of UBC or low density of 360 is more representative of kelp forest density? given that fish are not as evenly distributed throughout, and how does transect selection affect that? I.e., are you selecting transects based on where you think most fish will be, or are they completely random within a site? Cool, yeah, good question. So, um, I think that, let me see if I answer this how I think it was asked. I think that yes, because this was a, a temperate reef kelp forest project, the, the kelp and like the verticality of kelp forest does come into play. Um, one of my assumptions was that the more complex sites with the higher rocky relief and greater kelp abundance would mean that there would be a lot more fish up above. And I just don't think that they are that uniformly distributed throughout the water column, at least at the resolution that I can get from 360 video right now. Um, so maybe if the transects were swam at a different elevation, half the water depth or even up above in the canopy that would look different. Um, yeah, I do think kelp forests play an impact. And then what was the second part of that? Um, transect selection. So are you oh, yeah, finding so, your transects where you think the most fish will be? Yeah, so transect selection was, I was trying to capture as many of those macro habitat types within each site. So when I returned to sites, as I did for you know, many dives at each site, say okay I've already gotten the very high relief stuff at you know site A so now the next time I go back to site A I'm going to swim at a lower relief uh, area of the reef so I tried to just cover the entire reef. Ooh, and one more um, somebody says hi Cam excellent work for your NMDS plots what pairwise diver diversity slash dissimilarity metric did you use was it Bray Curtis dissimilarity or something else? Uh, it was Bray Curtis. Again, please join me in thanking and congratulating Kong. So we're going to have, there's some snacks and things over here. I think the committee's going to take him away for a little while. And uh, we'll bring him back in a little bit. And maybe we'll get the camera to film it in, in VR. <laughs> please join me in congratulating Kong for a great presentation.